for the United States, the world wars are like the Godfather movies, right? Because the second one is considered the more substantial and the better, the better one, right? Well, the first one is the one that gets, is, more, is protested more, and the United States is, is involved sort of at the very, very, very tail end. And then this, this, the World War II is the one where um, the United States, it, it, gets, it joins the war later than other countries, but is involved much longer, plays a much more substantial role, and really comes out of it like the world that we we know of today, where the, where this this whole concept of should the United States be the world's policeman, or should we should we have our you know it be involved in all these places, or as you know should we should we be leading on some level, leading the world in this in like democracy or or, or anything like that, right? Should we intervene in this country or that country? Is it our responsibility? Um, that that stems at really from this war, right? Because after World War I, uh, the Wilson is, Wilson, Woodrow Wilson is going to go to Europe. He's going to participate in the peace conference after World War I. He's going to want to join the League of Nations. It's not going to happen. The United States is basically, and he's going to, he's going to be termed out. He's going to die, actually. All right, he had a stroke, and he's, I don't think he lives much longer. And the United States, from the end of World War I till World War II, is, it goes through what's called, what's usually referred to like in high school as a period of isolationism. Right? They're not, which is really just they're not, they're not necessarily getting involved in what's going on with the League of Nations, what's going on in Europe, right? Because in Europe in the 1930s, there's some pretty wild stuff going on, right? And also an important thing to, remember, to note is the, uh, after, this is the first war, once it ends, the size of the military is not going to severely, uh, contr is it contract? Is that when it gets smaller? Contract. You, every, every war throughout, uh, you know, even like the Civil War, the Civil War involved um, millions of people, right? 600,000 people on both sides, if you include both sides, are going to die. Within a few years of the Civil War, the, Amer the, Un the Army of the United States is about 30,000 men, 30,000 people. It shrinks, uh, it shrinks a lot. After World War I, it goes, you know, it goes back to a peacetime army. So the uh, military is not going to go back to a peacetime you know, size, right? There are going to be massive armies in Europe. The United States is one of them. The Soviet Union is the other. And uh, actually, those armies are going to stay in Europe, and stay in Japan. We, the United States still has troops in Japan, thousands. There are still thousands of troops and in, in, in American bases in Germany, right? The, the Korean War, which is fought uh, five years after this war, World War II concludes, Right is a war. With, there, there are still thousands of American troops on the border of North and South Korea. A war which never ended. Right. So this is where we, this is you know, the idea of having of of, of where it's commonplace to have uh, the military of the United States pretty much all over the world, and the the sort of way we accept that we that the military of the United States might. Intervene here, or intervene there, or carry out an airstrike there. You know what I'm saying? That how it's not really seen as a, a, a surprise necessarily um, comes from is a result of this war, basically. And one of those, and it's not one of those reasons is because the the whether, pretty much every every nation, whether they won or whether they lost in this war, as far as you know, as far as treaties conclude, winners and losers. Um, pretty much every nation is completely devastated. The infrastructure is just is, their infrastructure is destroyed. Japan, uh, the, the nation of the empire of Japan, is the United States is, is basically going to like burn it to the ground before they even use nuclear weapons uh, in, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They're going to burn pretty much every major city to the ground. All right, Eng England's going to be destroyed. Germany is definitely going to be destroyed. Russia is going to be lose. Russia, uh, the Soviet Union, loses twenty million people in this war. Just one country, right? Twenty million. Two. Starts. And when the United States gets involved, Norman Rockwell, this is actually what I think discussed at the beginning of the chapter on the, on the war, chapter 22. Norman Rockwell is going to have this depiction, uh, and then they were used for, for, for advertisements for the war, too, to buy war bonds. Uh, he, depiction of, of four different scenes in America, right? Four different scenes that are depicting four different types of freedom. And he's going to claim that the United States would be waging this war, World War II, would get involved in order to defend these four freedoms. And Franklin Roosevelt is going to latch on to this concept and really uh, promote it. 
So similar to, you know, in World War I, the idea was we were fighting to make the world safe for democracy. Right? This is we're fighting the four freedoms. This whole idea of keeping the world free. Right? There's freedom and there's tyranny. Uh, and we're, we're on the side of freedom, supposedly. So the four freedoms were, who can read? Who knows how to read? Who's literate? No. Uh, speech, right? There's this, see, see this, see speech? There's sort of, these are very general depictions though, right? There's this guy, average looking guy, standing up at a, a community meeting or something, right? Exercising his right to freedom of speech without fear, right? Without fear. Freedom of speech, freedom of worship. What's worship? Religion, thank you. Fear, freedom from fear, right? During, during the Depression, Roosevelt was, uh, it's a very famous line he used, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. And there's a group, two parents tucking in a child. These are all white people, by the way, Jesus. And then freedom from want, right? And apparently you want turkey. Freedom of, of speech, worship, fear, and want. So speech is pretty common, right? We, we all this, what, what is, what, like we have freedom of speech it's actually in our, our, our collection of laws in the Constitution. Where, where does freedom of speech fit into the Constitution? It's one of the amendments. Actually, worship too. The first two, freedom of speech, freedom of worship, right? These, this, these are both in a constitutional amendment. Which one? Which, which, which one? <laughs> which one? The, yeah, there you go. The first one, yeah. That'd be cool if you got a foam finger that had, it just had First Amendment on it. You're like, yeah, it's the best one. Freedom of assembly, freedom of worship. The rights, the, 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 the rights, that, the rights that people in America or any, anywhere, but you know, this, this is the laws that we have. You have the right to get together with other people and speak freely. If you, have, if you all believe in a certain, have a certain faith, believe in a certain God, then practice that faith together, right? Without fear of, uh, of repression. Yeah, the other two are more general, right? Freedom of fear, freedom of want. Want, want is really, freedom of want, or freedom from want is, what is want? What is, if you say freedom from want? From wanting, yeah, it's, it's basically, you want stuff and you don't have it. But it's, it's, it means, it's basically like poverty, right? Freedom from the idea, I, I mean, it's, you, you see there's a family, they're getting together, they're having a nice, uh, this full, you know, meal that, I mean, well, at least there's a big turkey. There's a really big turkey. Right, so want. They want the idea. This is more of an economic issue, I guess. These are more, these are really vague, right? It's kind of a vague thing. Um, but you obviously, you know, you have uh, in this war, this is a little complicated because the, uh, at, the Soviet Union is going to be on the side of the United States. And uh, their concept, their, you know, concept of, Freedom of speech and things are a little different. They have, you know, does anybody know who, who, is, who is in charge of the Soviet Union who, at the time of this war? He takes over, he's basically, there's a revolution, you know, we talk, we've discussed it a little bit. At the end of World War I, there's a revolution in Russia, a communist revolution, in which the Bolsheviks, the Socialist Party, takes over. And then uh, it's led by a guy named Lenin. Lenin dies, and then eventually this other guy takes over, and he leads, he leads until, he dies in 1953. From the late 20s, mid late 20s into the early 50s, Stalin. His name is Joseph Stalin. He's a total asshole. Just saying. I mean, he's like a really, really. Re he is. So, he actually. They're the leader of the Red Army during the uh, revolution in Russia. Is a guy named Leon Trotsky. Uh, there's when Lenin dies. There's this. He Stalin has all of all of these different uh, figures in the Soviet in the Soviet government assassinated or exiled or put in prison. And this guy Trotsky uh, ends up being exiled to Turkey for a while. He lives in Turkey. And then he moves to Mexico City, where he dies. He dies in Mexico City in 1940, right before, right before, right, sort of as this war is getting started, Trotsky. He lived with these two folks who lived in Mexico City uh, named Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo. You guys know Frida and Diego Rivera, the muralist and the, yeah, he lived with them. So, okay. Anyways, this is, yeah. So that's why the chapter is called Fighting for the Four Freedoms. Fighting for the Four Freedoms. Can you still have, like, the Second Amendment? That's the, that, 
but no, the second amendment, the first ten are, are, are the the first ten amendments were were all re all put in at once. Yeah, in seventeen ninety one, they were added to the Constitution. So, so the, the chapter twenty two is, is fighting for freedom. World War II, nineteen forty one to nineteen forty five. Those years, because this is a class on the history of the United States. Yay! U.S. Can we get, can we get a USA chant going? U.S. No. Okay. You seem like she was, you were about to. You were kind of into it. Now you don't look like you're into it. Uh, so the years 1941 to 45 are the years the United States are, is officially like declares war on somebody and we're involved in this war. And then the war ends in 1945. But this war starts much earlier, right? Much earlier. Kind of like World War I. Uh, but even, even earlier, it had been going on for an even long, longer period of time. Does anyone know when there's a, there's a specific event given for this war starting, and you could kind of debate that and say it started earlier, but does anybody know what, what's usually cited as the beginning of World War II? You can, if you're guess, if you're if you're assuming it's something the Hitler guy did, you're you're right. It's must, blame the mustache. Is any nobody? What do you guys? You are watching. You're you're watching 16 and Pregnant. You're not watching the History Channel, are you? You guys are all watching Teen Mom, or the Cupcake Wars. The Cupcake Wars. Or the when he sunk his boat as an American? No, that was no, that was that was World War One. Uh, no, yes. When yes, when most most people will say World War One began because when Germany, actually the Soviet Union, both of them invade Poland. Germany invades Poland in September of 1939, and then as a result of that, England declares war. England and France declare war on Germany. So England, France, and Germany, these, these, Europe, these three you know, European countries, these, big, these main countries in Europe, that's when, when they declare war, that's when the war starts, right? When these France, I mean, France Germany, and England are kind of like the, as far as like Western civilization. But arguably, this war started significantly earlier. Uh, not, nine, not in, there's lots of folks to say that this, that this war did not start in 1939, in September of 1939, but possibly two or even three years earlier, you could see, I mean, there was, there was conflict, there was fighting between nations that could arguably be seen as the opening stages of this war. And let's talk about two, we're gonna talk about two of them. Actually, let's start, let's start on that one. Yes. So 1937, right? Japan invades China. Right? Not necessarily, not viewed by most people as the start of World War II, but you have the one of the, the you know other than Germany, Japan is really the there's the ax, the Axis as they're called. Japan, Japan is the most is is a very is a very you know powerful, wealthy, large country. They invade the largest country in the world. China has the mo the largest population and is one of the largest land masses in the world, right? Why why you would think maybe that could be the start of, the, of a world war, right? Ch I mean, invading China is kind of a big deal, right? You know. Maybe, yeah. And, and, and Japan, and like uh, Nazi Germany, Nazi Germany is going to end up controlling about half of Europe. They're going to invade, successfully invade eight countries before, the, before they end, the, you know, the, the war sort of turns against, the, it, it not in their favor, and they start losing. And Nazi Germany will invade Poland. They will occupy Czechoslovakia, Luxembourg, Belgium, France, Austria, I can keep going, and there's, is that six? There's two more. Somebody help me out here. Oh, Holland, right, which is a good, Holland's an important one. Does anyone know why? It's based, it really, Holland is where someone lived who wrote a, who kept a diary that some of you might have read in high school. Anne Frank, right, Anne Frank, Holland. Yes, the same place that they smoke weed, legally, Amsterdam. There's a museum there. Or it's called the Sino-Japanese. For some reason, when, when China is involved in a war, they used to call it the Sino-Japanese. Like there, there, were, there were two Sino-Japanese wars. Ch wars between China and um, Japan. One of them was in the 1890s, and Japan won that war. Both of these countries, China and Japan, ha had sort of uh, um, attempted to modernize you know, as they began to interact more with European countries and other countries in the, in the early 20th century, late, late 19th, early 20th century, Japan is going to industrialize, build their military up, and 
are going to really, um, you know, you see the way a lot of people are very familiar with Nazi Germany, very familiar with the uh, invasion and occupation of multiple countries in Europe, and also they also carried out um, a genocide, basically, or a, that's that's pretty well known. What was it called? What do we call? What do we refer? What do we refer to? What the, the, the Germany did to Jewish people in in Europe and others? What's it called? The huh? The Holocaust. Right, everyone's familiar with the Holocaust. They, you know, um, in a some in a similar fashion, at least as far as feeling some sort of supremacy or ethnic supremacy, the Japanese have a very uh, have a had a very like sort of superior attitude towards other countries in East Asia, right? They saw themselves as a, as a dominant country in that region, and when it and their relationship with China uh, is one that goes back centuries and centuries, right? The Mongols had attempted to invade Japan, right? So there's a lot of there's all this there's all of this sort of um, built up back and forth aggression, kind of like how France and Germany had. Um, at this particular moment in history, the Japanese have a much more modernized, industrialized society, a much more powerful mil military, and a functioning government. The government in China at the time is not is, controls some cities, some coastal areas, but China is still like 90% peasants. It's very large. Um, anyways, so in 1937, the Japanese invade um, main, what's called mainland China. Right? They call it main, they say mainland China. They're basically China proper, like, right, right? There's other areas. In 1932 or 31 or 32, they had invaded Manchuria, which is north of China, right? You know, there's Mongolia, there's Manchuria. But they, they invade China, like that, you know. We're, we're, um, and there's this war against the Chinese, basically. So two, and this, is, this happens two years before uh, World War II officially begins. And they go, and it's, there's, they invade a, uh, Capture a bunch of different cities. Basically, there's there's they they end up be, occupying the place until the end of World War II. They uh, invade a particular city called Nanking. It's spelled with a J. It's Nanjing. Uh, military invades China. They get to this city called Nanking. Um, I call it Nanking. And they uh, the, when the city surrenders, they basically carry out some pretty uh, brutal executions. Uh, there's a lot of sexual assault. There are people. I mean, if I was tr this is this is one of the nicest images. If you Google search, it's called the Rape of Nanking or Nanking Massacre. This is probably one of the more tame conservative images I can find. If you want to, I, I mean, if you have a, it's, it's, if you if you if you're not easily um, what do you call it, uh, disturbed. Then you, I would, I would Google, Google image search it because there are, there's like pictures with you know, four hundred heads chopped off and the heads are all stacked up, like some really, really brutal, like uh, infants with bayonets through them. There was a woman in Nanking. There were, there were estimated some nights there were a thousand rapes. One woman was reportedly raped, uh, gang raped by thirty-seven Japanese soldiers. Like some pretty, pretty aggressive stuff, right? Pretty aggressive stuff. So when this when this war start, and when this war starts or when the United States gets involved in this war, I mean China is a very strategically important place, uh, and so the the government at the time in China they're called the Guomindong, um, their leader is Chiang Kai Shek. They're gonna they're gonna be seen. You know Roosevelt Roosevelt is uh, the the United States is gonna try to portray this government in China as one of the countries that's going to be a part of this, like a, some post-war world, right? They're going to, they're, they're, they're going to have some sort of influence because they're very large. It's a very large country and they play a very impor important role because, you know, and, and, and Japan is, you know, they're basically dealing with an occupation from Japan throughout the entire war, right? Um, so, so China, yeah. So they invade China in 1937 uh, and then eventually but what, what, ends up, what ends up happening after the Japanese invade China, uh, the United States has an oil embargo, an embargo against Japan, right? like, like economic sanctions, right? And also the United States is in possession of other parts of, you know, there's China, but then the allied countries, the countries that make up the allied powers, you have England, France, and the United States. Does anybody know other parts of East Asia that France, England, and the United States might have claimed possession of or control as colonies. There's a place called French Indochina. Does anybody know where French, what French Indochina was? 
No. It's the Brit Hong Kong is controlled by the British. That's good though. Hong Kong is controlled by the British. Burma is controlled. India, right? These are places, these are controlled, these are British British colonies. You know. The sun never sets on the British Empire. Nah, whatever. Whatever, England. Um, French Indochina, uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, it was Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, right? Which are just south of, or it might have just been Vietnam and Cambodia. Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, just south of um, China. So, and also, what is the United States? Is the United States in, have any sort of territory in, uh, in uh, East Asia and the Pacific? It's a place that's like 7,000 islands, seven. The Philippines, right? The Philippines. It was strategic. It, the reason the United States remember the United States there was this, there was a, a, a war in the Philippines. There there were Filipinos that wanted to not be controlled by the Spanish anymore, and then the United States got involved, fought a war against Spain. And rather than allowing for Filipino independence, they wanted to hang on to this territory. It's strategic, right? It's the it's a it's a stepping stone to China. This is like it's like you know, sort of a, a global. They see it, it's all strategic stuff, right? Japan sees it as strategic. There's, uh, there's a rubber that comes from the Philippines at the time. There was no synthetic rubber, right? People didn't know how to make synthetic rubber, so rubber came from the Philippines. Um, so basically, there's this, uh, you have all of these different countries and the allied powers that are in Asia, that are, you know, you know, that are controlling different regions as colonial territories. Japan starts to see themselves as being the country that should be, in, you know, have, be a dominant country in East Asia. So they invade China. And then there's, there's this conflict with the United States where there's an oil embargo and the United States is in the Philippines. So eventually, uh, this leads Japan to attack the United States, right? Because, the, no, I'm just kidding. December 7th, so, so the, remember, remember in the 1890s, the United States had annexed Hawaii, and then they'd fought in the Spanish-American War. They acquired Guam, the Philippines. They, ha they have this sort of presence in East Asia. They're also making life difficult for Japan with, this, with like an embar trade embargoes and stuff like that. Japan decides that it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily something they want to do, but they, do, they decide to attack the United States. They take out, carry out a surprise, uh, what's called, a, what's described as a surprise attack on the United States Navy at a place called Pearl Harbor, which is on the island of Oahu in Hawaii, right? Uh, and in an attempt to sort of take out a, the bulk of the United States Navy, right? Wh why, what, was, what was, so the, the argument is that the government, the, the government, like the president, right, David, 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 yeah, right, knew that Pearl Harbor was going to be attacked, and then what allowed it to happen? Didn't warn them. Why? Well, why would they need the Japanese to attack Pearl Harbor though? Because to get people to to be okay. Does Does anybody? But does anybody know? Has anyone? Do you know how many people? They've actually. There actually. There actually were surveys done at the time, like before Pearl Harbor. Like sixty percent of the country was knew, knew the United States was going to get involved in, in, in a war with Japan and Germany, right? And, and, and all, and, you know, and also the main the main uh, for for Roosevelt at least the main thing was was Nazi Germany, right? He did, they didn't actually they didn't actually um, the, when Japan attacks Pearl Harbor, which is a military target, right? Japan Pearl Harbor is a is a, it's a surprise attack. It's cowardly. It is a military target. They, but 2,500 2, Americans end up I'm losing their lives. It's the largest attack uh, as far as the damage caused um, in U.S. history. I guess, I mean, obviously not. If you took into account September 11th, that's pretty large too. And then there's also going to be, there. do you know that there are also going to be, uh, there's later on in February of 1942, there's going to be a Japanese submarine that's going to surface off the coast of Santa Barbara and launch torpedo into an oil refinery in Santa Barbara. Go Gauchos. You see Santa Barbara? And also Los Angeles and Oregon. There's going to be Japanese submarines. There's going to be a German submarine that's going to come up off the coast of Manhattan, right? There's, there's this, um, anyways. And also December 7th, so December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor, Japanese attack Pearl Harbor. The very next day, December 8th, the United States declares war on Japan, right? But they, but the main concern for the United States was what was going on in Europe, or for, at least for Franklin Roosevelt. But they declare war on Japan. Uh, they do not declare war on Germany because Germany hadn't attacked the United States, right? They're fortunate. I guess, I guess you could say they're fortunate in that uh, on December 8th, they declare war on Japan because Germany is an ally of Japan. Three days later, 
Germany uh, declares war on the United States, basically. So they're at war in Europe and in the Pacific. Where was I going with that? So December 7th is Pearl Harbor. The very next day, the Japanese launched the invasion of the Philippines. They're going to invade and occupy the Philippines, right? Um, they are going to, they're, go, they're going to, um, I don't know how to say this other than they're going to kick a lot, they're going to kick a lot of ass for a little while, right? Like the, the Japanese invade the Philippines and occupy it. The United States, actually, the troops that surrender at the Philippines, uh, there are going to be about 75,000 American soldiers that surrender because they're just completely overwhelmed and taken by surprise. 75,000 75, American troops to surrender. It's the largest surrender, uh, you know, largest number of troops to surrender in, in one place in American history. It's like the largest, you know, military blunder in American history. Uh, and these 75,000 troops are then force marched like 65, 70 miles to a prisoner of war camp. They're not treated very well by the Japanese. Uh, does anyone know one of the reasons for that? The concept of they because it was it was sort of they were looked down upon for the fact that they surrendered seventy five thousand people surrender. If you um, look at some of the statistics on the island, some of these battles that are going to happen in World War Two, is anyone, is anyone familiar with some of these? Like if I say Guadalcanal, anyone know Guadalcanal? Iwo Jima. What about Iwo Jima? Right? Has anyone ever seen the picture where the Americans are raising that flag or the statue in in Virginia, outside of DC? Yeah. I, well, the actual picture might have been staged, but they actually did that, yeah. But Iwo Jima, and Iwo Jima, you're going to have, uh, do, do, when it comes to surrendering and being becoming a prisoner of war, uh, it is not necessarily a common practice with uh, the Japanese military. They're, they actually had field manuals, military field manuals written in the early 20th century, which explicitly stated that to not be taken as a prisoner of war, to not be taken alive. Uh, the Geneva Accords on the Treatment of Prisoners, which were held in 1929, the Japanese attend that. There are Japanese diplomats that attend that, but the actual agreement out of it, like how you treat prisoners, right? The hum you know, sort of like what we would call human rights issues. Uh, they don't actually sign. The Japanese government does not agree to them. Um, they're, they're, yeah. Does anyone know when this war ends in 1945? Does anyone know when the last Japanese soldier is actually comes out of, comes off of one of these, these, there's all these islands in the Pacific where they're fighting. The war ends in 1945. Does anybody know when the last confirmed Japanese soldier actually comes off of one of these islands and returns to Japan and takes his uniform off? 1974. 1974. There were, there were people that, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. There were, there, yeah. So, so, so it definitely in, into the 50s, there are, there are people who sort of stayed on these islands, yeah. Um, there was, does anyone know a guy, uh, ever heard of a guy named John Kennedy? John F. Kennedy patrol boat in World War II in the Pacific, what's called a PT boat. And he, he told a story where there was a Japanese plane that was shot down above them. And they saw the pilot uh, eject and then perish, and then his parachute came out. And he lands in the water. This patrol boat goes over to this where this pilot landed, assuming, okay, we're just gonna take this guy in the boat and take him prisoner. And that's that's just how it is, right? We're gonna help we're gonna help him out of the water and he's gonna become our prisoner. When the boat pulls up, this Japanese pilot takes his sidearm out and starts shooting at the boat. <laughs> Has any, what's a kamikaze pilot? Well what was a kamikaze pilot? Yeah, as the war so as this so the Jap Japan's gonna be very successful early on in this war. They're going to like like Germany was in Europe, Japan is going to invade China, they're going to invade Burma. When they're going to invade Hong Kong. They're going to invade French you know, China. They're going to occupy Vietnam, right? They're going to occupy Vietnam, Cambodia. Um, a lot of the folks that in, you know, end up fighting in, in the Vietnam War or for Vietnamese independence against France or against the United States, South and North, you know, are having to deal with Japanese occupation, right? They, are, they had already been occupying Korea for, since like 1910, right? So when the Japanese invade Hong Kong, which is controlled by the British, and the British actually evacuate Hong Kong, do you, if this is in 1940, it is the first, or 41, it is the first colonial territory that the British had had to surrender since Yorktown, 1781. Since, since the American colonies became, so they went 160 years without ever giving up a, a, a colonial territory. They had to give it one up to Japan. Japan sort of pushed through East Asia like really, really aggressively. 
They use bicycles too. If you see a lot of this footage, they're using these bikes because a lot of these islands, you know, they're jungle and there's little trails. It's cool. So they're getting some cardio in. Anyways, the, but if there, there was a book that came out recently about these kamikaze pilots where as the war begins to um, uh, shift, Japan's less successful in the war. They start to lose battles. They lose some pretty important naval battles against the United States. They start to get pushed off of a lot of these islands and pushed out of East, East Asia and, and sort of pushed back towards the Japanese mainland. Um, they start to conduct kamikaze missions where these pilots will basically take, take their plane and try to crash it into a battleship, trying to sink the whole battleship, right? It happens, it's, it's, you know, kind of a, interesting. Anyways, I mean, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's um, pretty, pretty aggressive or whatever. But there's actually a book that came out recently uh, about it takes like letters, basically letters that they were a lot of younger, younger guys. A lot of them, a lot of them have been college students and other stuff like letters they wrote home, letters they wrote to girlfriends, to wives, different things. Just sort of showing, you, know, you look at the content of these letters and it's just like normal stuff, right? They're talking about school, they're talking about the future, they're talking about what they're going to do with, after the war ends. And then they end up in a situation where they're crashing, a, where they're going on a suicide mission, crashing a plane into a battleship or attempting to. And that must have been really scary to be on a ship like that, right? Where there's like a plane coming right at you. Oh. So, does anybody know what, uh, has anybody ever heard the, 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 the quote, quotation that an admiral, Japanese admiral, said after Pearl Harbor? Because they were, the, the, the Japanese were well aware that the United States was a very large country, a very industri industrialized country, and they could, they could end up mobilizing and producing a very powerful military, and would eventually probably overwhelm what, you know, the military of, of Japan. They had like a, they had like a, they knew they had like a time, a time, timeline, a deadline. You know, they, they think they, they knew that they had maybe six, six months to a year wh where if we don't take, if we don't really cause significant damage against their Navy and army and allow them to maintain some sort of force that they'll probably, you know, end up defeating us. Right. Uh, does any, does anybody, anybody, no one ever heard the, the, the we've awoken, was it a sleeping giant? No one's ever heard this. After the Pearl Harbor attack, a Japanese admiral is reportedly said, "We've awoken a sleeping giant." Have you, ever, you never heard that? You guys don't just sit around and talk about Pearl Harbor with each other and like quote quote various admirals from the 1930s and 40s on the shield. Uh, anyways, so I, well, if you're ever if you're ever in a conversation, if you're ever in a conversation, because you know this happens. Where somebody brings up this line from, from after Pearl Harbor, this Japanese admiral supposedly said the attack on Pearl Harbor had awoken a sleeping giant. Uh, he never said this. He never said that. They, there's a movie made later called Tora Tora Tora. This movie is made about World War II, where they there's a line written. Some screenplay writer, some guy writing a screenplay, gives this guy this line, and this admiral, the character actor playing this admiral, says this line in the movie, and ev now everyone thinks that he actually said it, and he didn't actually say it, right? This is a completely different quote. It's similar, though. It means the same thing. They're not a fiery, a fiery, impulsive people as you are. But when they begin to move in a given direction, they move with the steady momentum and perseverance of a mighty avalanche. That's, what, that's how I move every morning when I'm going to the bathroom. Just get out of my way, get out of my way, get out of my way. <laughs> Just kidding. Does anyone know who said this, when this is from? This is, this, is, uh, this is what Sam Houston said. He was the governor of Texas when Texas decided to secede from the Union during the Civil War. He's, he, he, was, he, he opposed the idea of, of leaving the United States because he said, basically, uh, the, the, the North is going to preserve, they're going to keep us in this Union, they're, gonna get, they're going to win this war, the Civil War. They're not fiery people as you are, but when they begin to move in any given direction, they move like a mighty avalanche. Mighty avalanche, sleeping giant, Right? Maybe an avalanche with giants in it. So that's Sam Houston in 1860. This is Atlanta. This is Atlanta, Georgia, 1864, 